Hi, and welcome to the Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast presented by Wolf Precision Incorporated, where we learn about and share long range shooting and custom rifle building. I am your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome to the show. Hi, and welcome to episode 176 of Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast. I'm your host, Jamie Dotson, and welcome back to the show. In this episode, we're going to be continuing on our custom rifle building series, and in this one, we're going to be talking about barrels, some food for thought, some things you might not think about, and some problems when it comes to your reloading process. So we want to share some time talking about the dangers and damage you can do to your nice new barrel as well. So it ought to be a great podcast. So without further ado, here we go. So before we get started, I want to say a quick thank you to Trigger Tech. Trigger Tech makes great triggers. They're made from our great Canadian friends in the north. They are probably one of my favorites because they are safe, they are easy to install, and they are easy to adjust. We recommend them for all of our rifles here, whether it's a custom rifle or a kit build. You can learn more about Trigger Tech and all the great models that they offer over at TriggerTech.com. That's TriggerTech.com. We'd also like to thank MDT. MDT is a great chassis manufacturer. We talk a lot about them here at our. We talk a lot about them here on our podcast. We actually use several of them here at our long range shooting school, and I personally own one or two myself, including the new Jay Allen. One of the things I like about MDT is they're a big enough manufacturer that they keep their lead times down. So they're big enough to stay ahead of the lead times and yet make super high quality. They haven't lost touch with what started their company and what keeps them going today. So they make lots of different makes and models, including the Oryx, an entry level that we think is a fantastic chassis, right up to the new Jay Allen that they reintroduced, and we have one here on my personal rifle. So if you want to learn more about upgrading your rifle with a chassis, stop over to mdttac.com. That's mdttac.com today. So where to begin talking about barrels? This has been a great conversation that we've had here for a while. We have several rifles that we just finished, we just built. We get a chance to play with them all the time. We have them in our machine shop. Barrels really is the blood of what we do here. So if you think about what we do as custom rifle builders, the receiver is the heart. You know, that's where it all happens. And then getting everything together properly, making sure that you have a well-built rifle, making sure that all the machining work is done correctly to accept the bullet into the barrel, which we call the ACE system. And then you get into the rifle barrel itself. But the barrel, I would say, falls into a category that that is sort of the lifeblood of the rifle. And the reason I say that is, is if you think about how blood flows through the body, if you cause issues in your arteries, you cause issues with your health. And the same thing happens when you start talking about and thinking about rifling in a barrel. Not only that, but you have to take the condition and the materials that the barrels are made out of. So I could probably spend five days talking about rifle barrels. And I'm going to try to narrow it down to about 15, 20 minutes just hitting on some of the highlight points. But I think it's overlooked as just a tire is a tire in that an airplane is an airplane or that a motor is a motor or that a boat is a boat. We launch it up as it's just part of the rifle. But when you start looking and diving behind the curtains a little bit here and saying, what really makes a great shooting barrel? All bets are off. Most people really don't understand the art of it, the craft of it. The, the I think, honestly, I think there's a little bit of witchcraft involved in it on how some of these guys figure some of these things out. It's nothing that I would like to actually do here. There is such an art. I think it would take you a decade just to be able to make a good barrel. And then to make a great barrel, your kids will be making it. That's how long it will take. Look at John Krieger. So when we start talking about rifle barrels, there are so many ways that rifle barrels are made and some are purpose-driven. So if you think of the hammer-forged barrel, I really think the finishes on a hammer forge barrel are really nice. I think they last long. I think they're great for battle weapons. Think of like AR-15s and such, where they can hammer forge the chamber into and make the rifling at the same time. Sort of makes sense manufacturing-wise. And the rifling isn't actually all that bad, but talking to the people who have the machines, they don't lend themselves well to accuracy when it comes to thinking about putting it in a precision rifle. So... 
most of the rifles that they're going in are capable of shooting good and some great, but none are at that competition level. And that is coming from the people that make it. Now, I'm hoping that as future goes on and technology evolves, that you're going to see barrels come alive. You're going to see new processes being introduced from the way that gun drilling, 100-year-old technology and how rifle barrels have been made are changing the industry. And I think technology or what we consider machining tools, think of the CNCs and what we're able to do now, you might really start to see some things come up that allow us to really take and make some world-class rifle barrels. And I think you might see that technology improve them. So right out of the gate, Hammer Forge, not for what we do here. Then you get into the argument between button rifled and cut rifled. That part... I think I'm okay with either. I think a really great button rifled barrel has huge potential for great accuracy. IBI has proven that. Schillen, Hart, they all use button rifle barrels. Think of Lothar Walther, the oldest barrel maker in the world, button rifled barrels. These are a very easy way to build barrels. Some say they don't shoot or they don't last quite as long as cut rifled. Some say that when you do the cut rifle barrel, you can do a little bit better job in cutting the lands and crews rather than swaging or forming them with a tool. I would agree. Others say that, you know, it's the processes that are the secret, you know, besides good tooling. And we'll come back to that. But I'm okay with with button rifle barrels. I have no qualms with it. They have set world records in bench rest for many years. Some would argue that they don't last quite as long as cut rifled. I don't know if I see the evidence. The other thing that you hear a lot of people say that when it does give up its ghost, it gives it up very fast. So think of like, you know, if you're shooting a cut rifle barrel in 308 with 10,000 rounds through it, your, your groups are just going to keep progressively opening up. But what the rumor has, and again, none of this really has statistically been proven, is that when a button rifle does finally give up its ghost, it's like all of a sudden the rifle will just stop shooting. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. We have IBI barrels here, and we have not seen that. But we don't have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of rounds anecdotal evidence or statistical evidence to prove it or disprove it either way. And then you get into cut rifle barrels. And with cut rifle barrels, think of Krieger. They are able to basically form the rifling by cutting and removing material away rather than swaging it, which is what a button does. Totally different process from cut rifled. Cut rifled is slowly going pass by pass and starting to shave away material from that barrel, forming the lands and grooves. Quite different from button rifled. My experience with cut rifle barrels is, think of Krieger, is they shoot great. They machine well. I think their finishes are fantastic. They do hand lap them afterwards, and their consistency and their hand lapping uh, makes fantastic finishes. But here's where I'm going to stop and go back to three or four more important things than the actual brand that's stamped on the barrel. First, I want to start back with where the steel comes from and the processes that they go through just to get it ready to turn it into a rifle barrel. A lot of your rifle barrel makers, for se, buy open stainless steel on the market, 416 or something like that. Whether it's made in China, whether it's made overseas, I mean, I've, I was watching some video of them forging st- from scrap metal automobiles, and they're using parts and pieces. Um, in India, they were using just all kinds of scrap to forge billets. And, you know, these things wind up in the market and in the system. And so for me, right out of the gate, one of my bigger worries, if I was to worry about a rifle, because keep in mind, we're scoring the rifling. What that means is we're scoring the inside of the barrel. Think of like taking, you know, your scissors and making a score line and then how you're able to rip that paper now a little bit easier, right? Same thing happens with a barrel. We're scoring those lands and grooves into the barrel. And when you start talking about 50 or 60,000 PSI or more, if that barrel has any flaws in the manufacturing, where that steel came from, was it inspected? Is it actually made specifically for rifle barrels, that becomes a worry. Think of that barrel opening up like a can opener in front of you, splitting it to seams and letting not only the pressure out, but parts and pieces fly. So right out of the gate, one of the things that worry me, whether it's a big shop or little shop, is where they are getting their steel from, 
the testing processes and procedure, as well as the makeup of the steel itself. Is there recycled material in there, for example? Then once it turns onto the open market and they're purchasing it, you know, can they verify where it came from? A lot of times businesses fall victim to this. Uh, We have really fought hard internally to not fall victim to these traps of just buying things on the open market, thinking that, you know, hey, it doesn't matter where we get the steel from. Let's just do a search for whatever steel we're looking for or aluminum, right? It matters, especially when we're not, we're talking about something that's going to be pressurized. And I think a lot of times, a lot of these companies fall victim to the fact that they will buy the cheapest that they can find that they feel is a good chance of being safe. And so when you start talking about the prices of basically all materials going through the roof, it makes sense to try to find stuff that actually is less expensive or to to shop around to get your best deal. But that said, what are you risking? Where did the steel come from? Why is it cheaper? How was it made? Who made it? Is the recycled materials that could potentially have other contaminants in there? These are things to think about. Again, it's not like we're just making a set of monkey bars, right? We are actually making a tube. We're drilling it out and we're scoring it with rifling and then we're going to pump it up to 60,000 PSI. Think about how close that is to your face and your loved ones. Would you feel comfortable just taking any scrap piece of steel, drilling a hole through it, plugging the ends, putting a charge in it, and bumping it to 60,000 PSI while you're hanging on to it, right? That's what we're doing when we're making a rifle barrel and when we're shooting. The other part of it is the heat treat processes. So I've spent a lot of time talking to barrel makers. Uh, Mike from Krieger actually helped us 10 days at the Great American Outdoor Show prior to COVID, which is awesome to have him here. And, you know, I've, I've spent hours talking to them on the phone, all the other barrel makers. One of the things that we know happens when you're turning steel and when you're doing all this machining work is you can and do oftentimes can put stress into the actual barrel itself. In some applications, that's not too big of a deal. But when we're talking about a barrel that's going to be heated and cooled in cycles as we shoot it, any stress that's into the barrel can actually cause issues with the actual barrel bending or warping while it's heating up or cooling down. Again, not bad if you're just making monkey bars from day to day. But if you're talking about precision rifles and you're talking about great shooting, having stress-free steel as well as a de-stressing method afterwards. Krieger, for the longest time in her early years, if I remember correctly, that they used to have cryogenic chambers that they would cryogenically treat all of their barrels. I have been out of the loop with Krieger for a little while, although I do plan on talking to Mike here very shortly. I might even invite him back on the podcast to see what's changed. You know, How are they dealing with the stress management? Are they still cryogenically treating how are they evaluating this bar stock? Because you think when this bar stock rolls in on a flatbed truck, we're talking about 30 to 60 feet long bar stock that's, you know, on the back of a tractor and trailer being unloaded by forklifts that looks awful. That's what's going to be turned down and eventually turned into your barrel. That stress relieving process, knowing how much stress is in it. So a lot of people think that the barrel itself started from a two or three foot piece of material and it most of most of your steel like that is actually formed in long bars, long bars, right? And so the where it's cut, how it's handled, the processes it goes through as it's cooling can really affect the stress that's actually in these bars. And then they are cut up into smaller pieces and then handled until they're cut up into even smaller pieces when they get to the factory and then they're, they're turned down to the rifle barrels that we have today. So for me, when I, I talk to Lothar Walther and I've talked to Krieger, and I always like to hear the inside scoop. And by the way, I asked uh, Lothar Walther if I'd come down and do a little tour because we're starting to use more and more of their barrels. And when I'd asked, they said no. <laughs> they said, you can come down and visit, but we don't allow people to tour the shop. They keep a lot of these secrets close to their chest. Keep in mind, they're the oldest barrel maker in the world. But when I started grilling them about, because they've been asking us to use their stuff for probably close to five years now, and they have... A couple of things that I like, and we'll talk more about that here in a minute, and a couple of things that keep closer to chest. So they don't open source their steel. Their steel is actually made at the foundries to their recipe, which to me, that shows a level of responsibility on their end. And my guess is they've got 
lots of quality controls that the barrels have to go through as they're being processed through to eventually being wound up, being turned and gun drilled or however they do the drilling part of it for the barrel. And then they said they have the most advanced stress relieving on the planet, that the process that they have are set up by tons of metallurgists that actually removes all stress through the process and that we can actually flute the barrels without opening the bore up, which to me is fascinating. That's not common. One of the reasons why we always hesitate to flute barrels for say is that you always have the potential as you relieve metal from the outside of opening the bore up on the inside. We've done some videos with Gordy Gritters. One was accurizing a factory rifle. If you want to see it, it's a gunsmithing video. It's on the market. It's Gordy Gritters Accuracy Institute. We can watch the video where we put a lead slug down a fluted barrel and as soon as it hit the flutes, the lead slug slid freely. It was a couple of ten thousandths bigger than the bore before and after it. So you know, people say that they have opinions on things, but we've witnessed this stuff firsthand. We know it happens. Lothar Walther says, not with ours. So one of the reasons we're sort of excited is maybe getting the next year, we can custom turn some profiles here, but then we can also do some pretty cool fluting without potentially wrecking the accuracy of the rifle. So one of the things when you start talking about barrels is flutes look awesome and there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. But one of the reasons why we always hesitate to flute is that we know that this can happen and we know it can add an ingredient into the recipe that's not necessary. It's just aesthetics. It's just making the salad look better, right? But if it has the potential to make you really sick the next day, I'd opt for not to have the eye candy on my salad. And same thing with the rifle. We know that it's eye candy, right? It, it does relieve a little bit of weight, yes. It does help it cool a little bit better because of the more surface area, yes. There are some small benefits to it, but there is actually a downside of opening that bore up that you can potentially start to harm or basically open up your groups a little bit. Not a lot. I'm not saying the gun will go from a great shooter to not shooting at all, but we know that it can have this effect on the gun. So we're sort of a little hesitant when we do it, and we'd rather not. I mean, that's just, for me, I'd rather not put something in there, just purely aesthetics that would potentially open a groups up or change your accuracy, even if it's just a little bit, right? We've done all this work to get all the accuracy we can out of the rifle, you know, all of it, including like multiple patents. And then we go and we put something in there that we know is purely aesthetic and that could potentially take some of that accuracy away. So we opt not to. So that's one of the reasons why like I really am looking at Lothar Walther pretty heavily is the open source steel. They don't do that. They actually have founders that make their own steel and it's made to their recipes. I think the other part is, is they have a thing that's, that's called LW50 and I'm doing more and more research on it. A lot of people don't like to work with it because it's sort of harder to machine. But because we attach our chambers, we think there might be some benefits to the customers to bring that German steel here to complete some of the rifles. But we're always very mindful to keep an open mind to what's on the market as well as what has the potential to be a better value to our customers and not hurt the accuracy of the rifle. And so when we start looking at that, we have the potential to bring in, make our own contours, and potentially flute it without hurting anything. I think that's pretty cool, actually. So it's something we're going to play with. So we talked about the stress relieving process before and after. A, A lot of your companies don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy the equipment necessary to stress relieve If you think of just how much energy it takes to either heat up a barrel or cool it down, just one barrel, right? Now, start talking about that, uh, not just the equipment that's needed to do that, but then the amount of energy consumed to do it. And you start to overall look at how much this actually costs to actually stress relief barrels. It's A, it's, it's very expensive for the equipment, but it's also high energy inefficient you know so you've got these big bars of steel that don't heat up like chocolate chip cookies right and they're bringing them either up to temperature or they're cryogenically treating them down to temperatures and by the way they all have their proprietary processes so they don't share it they won't tell you the processes they found their ways that they like that that does a great job and they sort of hold the line the last thing i want to touch base on is before we start talking about the finished barrel right is talking about the tooling and the processes the oils, the jigging, you know, one of the things that we found with a lot of barrel makers is as soon as they try to speed processes up by using more aggressive tooling that cuts bigger, think of carbide over high-speed steel. Carbide tears, high-speed steel cuts. So you get somebody that says, hey, we can use this process now because it's faster and the tools will last longer. Then all of a sudden you start to get 
damage in the rifling. And so I always say that making a rifle is like a slow process or making a rifle barrel is a very slow process. And anything you do to speed that process up, just like anything else, you have the potential to cause issues. And I always say when you start talking to companies, it's the companies that are willing to spend the money to change the tools out fast, pay attention to tool wear life, and also know that, hey, we can only go so fast and these are the type of tools that we have to use or else we potentially damage or scratch or burger up the rifling. And there's a couple companies that have done this. Some of the most popular brands on the market today, we got one in here. And I, I don't like to throw brands under the bus here. That's not what I like to do. I, you know, everybody makes products that they think is great and that hold to their standards. It might not be ours, but it's theirs. And that's their business. I would never step on somebody else's business and say, this is why we don't use them, right? But that said, there are some really popular barrel makers out there that we just won't use. If you look on our website, you'll see we only use IBI and Krieger, and we're stepping up and starting to use a little bit of Lothar Walther. And the reason being is, for example, it's a really popular barrel in PRS, and without mentioning any names whatsoever. The barrel was brought in here to look through with a bore scope, and Richard was actually, it was for his, it was an AR, and Richard was looking through the barrels. It was a name brand barrel, like top of the line. And I got the bore scope out and I said, you want to see something interesting? Before you look in there, I'm just going to warn you, it's not going to look like a Krieger. And he looked in there and he pulled his head back. He was like, that's flipping terrible. (laughs) And it is. So what he was looking at was the tooling marks. So they sped up their processes. They feel that it doesn't hurt the accuracy, but visually you don't have that really nice finish in there. You got all these little like tooling marks and cuts and tears and yeah they're polished out but you can still see them they're all in there and for me you know that's no go and so when we we look at barrels we don't just look at brands and we don't just look at we want to know the processes of where the steel came from the heat treating processes the de-stressing process how the rifling is made how they're lapped and then we inspect the hell out of them here i mean we can put bushings in like Krieger is so consistent with their bore diameters that we can use one bushing for several different barrels from different lot numbers and it, it'll fit within probably two tenths, which is absolutely amazing for holding that type of quality of barrel. But that's what we look for, right? So you have to even go further into the company to say, okay, what tools are they using? What tooling are they speeding up their processes and then trying to polish out the lesser quality finish in the end because it's faster? That's what some of these decision makers do. And this is what winds up on your bench when you build a rifle. So you have to be mindful. The barrel is so important even before you start cutting that chamber in there. Everything that's been done to it leading up to you already has spoken as to how that rifle barrel is going to perform. So it has to be a quarter minute gun before you even start building it. The barrel has to have quarter minute accuracy potential. If the barrel's been boogered up, if the lands and grooves aren't super nice, if there's you know potential damage in there that they tried to polish out, if they were using tooling too long or they weren't de-stressing, you've got a gun that's going to shoot terrible before you even start. So that's the other part I want to dive into. The last thing I want to say is be weary of the people that sell barrels on the market there's a thing called curvature to the bore and some companies actually fix this by bending the barrels it's not uncommon it's been used in major manufacturing for years but your rifling is bowed or if you would cut a barrel completely in half from end to end the rifling is bowed this is one of the reasons why we developed the a system so we can get a straight throat on the backside. we're not dealing with that curvature because it doesn't start till it gets several inches into the barrel but then it also has a huge issue with how it handles the bullet Um, I mean, you'll see lots of different things that play out over this, but some companies will actually bend the rifle barrel itself, trying to straighten up the bore on the inside, not the turned on the outside. And whether they, they contour it afterwards, I don't know their processes. All I know is that if they're bending barrels, we don't buy them. And there are a lot of makers out there that actually do this. So, you know, these are questions that when I was purchasing or if I was purchasing a rifle barrel, I would be asking these questions. Like, for instance, I asked Krieger this directly. And their answer was, is we hold a certain tolerance. And if we find that any of our rifle barrels fall outside of this tolerance, we throw them away. That's a great answer. That's what I would be looking for. But if you ask that question and get somebody laughing like, ah, it's just Now, we don't do that often, only if it really needs it, I would be running away. The last thing I want to touch base on is, and this is so important to me, 
We just had a rifle barrel come in that had five or seven rounds shot through it. It was without saying the caliber or whatever, because I don't want the gentleman that did this to be thrown under the bus with the podcast, but I think this is so important. We're getting ready to do a reloading class, and in the reloading class, I talk about all these little cool things that I think can get the most accuracy out of your rifle, make it efficient, make it safe, make it repeatable. But for whatever reason, cleaning brass with stainless steel media in a wet cleaner has really taken hold. And already this year, we've seen two rifle barrels come in with damage from people shooting these little stainless rods through their barrel. So for crying out loud, we had a rifle. I'm going to do a video on this next week on our YouTube channel. I'll try to get in there and film it a little bit. We just had a brand new Krieger. has five or seven rounds to it. The customer had sent it in for me to look at it. He had actually bought it off of the internet. So the rifle had been rebarreled multiple times until it wound up in this customer of ours hands. And then that customer asked us, hey, this guy says he's got like five or seven rounds through it. And I'd like you to look at it, but I actually want you to change the caliber out for me. So I'm like, yeah, sure. I remember that rifle. And so I got the rifle here and it only did had five or seven rounds through it. The guy wasn't lying. But if you look down there with the bore scope, oh my God, you've seen like, where the stainless steel media, this is what my guess would be. I'm not 100% accurate because I tried to reach out to the gentleman that sold it, just trying to ask. And, of course, he hasn't gotten back to me. But you could see damage in the rifling. And my guess is that he was cleaning with this stainless steel media. And so you got this beautiful lapped Krieger barrel, right, just perfect from end to end. And then you got dings in the lands and grooves where the media has been shot down and was hitting as it's being shot down your barrel, Real great here, right? And then there were some edges on some, like the lands and grooves have really sharp edges. Uh, Krieger's has really nice edges on them where they were torn from the stainless steel media. There's nothing else that they were going to stick down that barrel to do that with five rounds through it. My guess is that they were using this stainless media that's sort of, I mean, everybody wants to clean their brass inside and out now. And it's funny how, I don't want to say influencers, but Something just sets that seed and all of a sudden it becomes the way that this is the new way to clean. I am telling you as a friend, until more information comes out about it, because we have customers that have come through a reloading class over the last several years that do this process. And I ask them, I'm like, how often do you find a piece of that stainless steel media stuck in a case after you dry it? And they're like, oh yeah, every once in a while you'll find one in there. And I'm like, how many do you think you're not finding? So we've already had two rifles this year that had this damage in it and one of them was because the customer was like, yeah, I, I use this stuff. And I'm like, and let me show you why you don't want to do this stuff, right? He had looked down his rifle barrel with a bore scope and he's seeing all these marks and he thought, well, it's got to be a defect in the steel. And, and I was like, well, what are you using to clean your brass? Because that looks really good to be the culprit here. And it's the same thing with the rifle barrel we just got in. It is ruined. It will probably never shoot. And the reason that customer probably showed it is he probably shot five or seven rounds through it. And it didn't shoot. It probably threw a bullet sideways because a bullet maybe got wedged or got deformed because maybe the tumbling media or whatever, that little stainless rods that they're using got jammed between the bullet and the rifling as it was running down a rifling or, or it was tearing the daylights out of the bullet as it was going down range. Who knows? But whatever it was, five or seven or 10 or 20 or however many rounds through the barrel, it doesn't look like there's been a hundred, that's for sure. But they opted to get rid of it. And my guess is because they damaged it. And they probably didn't know what happened. They probably shot it and was like, wow, that's really weird. There's something weird going on here. And that was it. That's the end of story. So what I would like to tell you as a reloader for crying out loud, I would never, ever, ever feel comfortable with taking stainless steel media and putting my brass in a soup and tumbling it around in there and then trying to get all of it out because you know it's in the case itself. And when you let something dry, if it sticks to the wall of the case or gets stuck in there somehow and you don't catch it, if it's in an area that you can't see. So unless you're going to bore scope every piece of brass out, I would not recommend using that process. So as much as it's really taken over by storm and even a lot of our customers are falling for it and saying, oh, this is how we're perfectly cleaning the inside of the brass. And I'm like, well, you know, that carbon's in there a little bit. When you clean it with other media, it gets it out of there. It's just a thin layer. But what I also find really important is that in the neck, that once you shoot that brass, um, that little bit of carbon and stuff that stays behind in that neck, even after we tumble and clean it, actually helps that bullet see a little bit easier, release a little bit easier. I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing at all. I think 
getting that perfectly clean using steel rods tumbling around inside your case and then some of them getting stuck and being left behind and then shooting that down your barrel, that's probably a more bad thing. So I would opt not to. So I just want to throw it out there that next week we're going to put this up on YouTube if I can get some good screenshots of it and show you what it looks like if you decide to use this process or the exposed danger that you have to destroying your rifle with one shot. So before we continue on, this is a podcast about barrels. I do want to thank our last sponsor, Krieger Barrels, the maker of fine cut rifle barrels. They are a family owned and operated business from the great state of Wisconsin. They have been making cut rifle barrels for two generations now, and they are some of the best world-class barrels you can buy. So they have a new program called Krieger Direct where you can have your barrel in as little as two to three business days. So I always say if you want the best and you need it now, stop over to KriegerBarrels.com. That's KriegerBarrels.com today. Just a couple quick updates and some news. So we have a new seven-day introductory no charge to our online long-range shooting school. So if you'd like to check out our online long-range shooting school, uh, you can do so for free for seven days. After that, it's a monthly fee. If you decide to stay on, we'd love to have you. We just posted up our 60th video and over 16 hours of instructional content. So that's a special that's going to be running in through January 1st. We also have a $50 off our long-range shooting school for 2024. If you sign up before December 31st, you get $50 off as our way of saying thank you. We are only going to hold 13 in-person classes or 65 students total, five students a class. So slots will start filling up right around Christmas time for spring. And by January, February, usually all the spring and summer classes are full. Fall classes usually fill by June or July. So stop over to wolfprecision.net and you can register there today. We'd also like to thank Trigger Tech. Trigger Tech is going to give away a trigger here on the podcast of choice. So thank you so much, Trigger Tech, for doing that. So if you want a Trigger Tech Diamond, this is a great opportunity to do it. So if you want to register, we're going to give the trigger away on Thanksgiving Day. We'll announce the winner Thanksgiving morning here on the podcast. And you can go over to our website and you want to sign up for our newsletter. That's step one. And step two. Two is to go to our YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you do both, you're in the running, and then we'll get a winner drawn on Thanksgiving Day. Thank you, Trigger Tech, for doing that. We are going to spend a lot of time now that the shooting school, the online long-range shooting school, will just be bonus content and some additional wrap-up, and then on to gunsmithing, on to building and cleaning. And so we're going to start spending a lot of time putting content up both on the Patreon page for our online school as well as YouTube which we think is just great information. So, for example, how to bore scope a barrel, what to look for, how to put your scope rings on properly, all of these little things. And we just did a video today that will go up on Friday morning, and that is actually on taking your rifle and maintaining it at the range, talking about all these little things that we find all the time that you have to be careful to check and keep checking while the rifle is new until you get it settled in to make sure that everything is holding together. So we're going to post that up as bonus content on our online long range shooting school and for free on our YouTube channel. So just stop over and look for Wolf Precision. And like I said, if you'd like to join our online long range shooting school, it is our in-person class, which we think gives you about seven years experience in three days here, but something that you can take from the comfort and convenience of your own home. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us. The next podcast, we're going to dive into scopes, rings, and bases one more time. And then we're going to move on and get some interviews here as we start wrapping up our hunting season and start talking shop with some of the industry and see what's all new and exciting out and about. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us. If you enjoy the podcast and you'd like to share it with someone you know is into this type of shooting, thank you for doing so. And if you enjoy the podcast, you would like to leave a nice comment. We really appreciate that as well. And if you really enjoy the podcast, if you'd like to join us and join the Wolf Pack for $3 a month and support the show, you can stop over to Patreon, look for Wolf Precision, and for $3 a month, support the show. Thank you so much for everybody who has done that so far. It really helps to keep the show on the air and keep buying all this cool equipment that we need to keep making the podcast just better and better over time. So thank you, everybody, for taking the time to join us here. My name is Jamie Dotson. I'm your host, and you're listening to Wolf Precision's Long Range Shooting and Custom Rifle Building Podcast.